have a body of work that is traditionally attributed to Shakespeare. Over the years, we've been duped. You know, I, I knew that there was a question around uh, who was the actual author of Shakespeare's works, but I, I thought that was just a modern thing, sort of a, a debate, you know, a way in to learn about Shakespeare, but it's from day one, isn't it? From, fi from the 1590s. I mean, wow, since the beginning. So, yeah, and the, yeah, and the author, I think, himself was engaging us in the authorship question, even as he was writing the work. So, yeah, it really took hold about 100 years after Shakespeare died. But, yeah, there's been a continuous chain of doubt. If Shakespeare didn't write Shakespeare, then who did? It's a legitimate question to ask. This question. It's been played upon, as you mentioned. He, he was um, disguising it in his writing. And also the portrait of Shakespeare, the pen and ink portrait, is way off and it's kind of a, as you say, an Elizabethan joke. It's just layer upon layer of mystery that, that it was, initially I thought, well, if let's say it was Edward de Vere, that he made a big mistake because there are so many clues, but that's not the case. He left clues just to be funny, right? <laughs> I mean, just to spark debate. To talk to debate and to get people to look at the works more closely, I think, and to also look at the Elizabethan age, it's a chronicle of the period, a very political one. So I think that because he couldn't speak in his own time, he was perhaps speaking to a later time and putting lots of things to engage the reader in the politics of the time and also off of the authorship, you know, to get the rightful claim to the author. Mark Twain, Charles Dickens, and Sigmund Freud are among the many famous figures who doubt that a businessman from Stratford-upon-Avon was England's star of poets. And it's been of interest to so many people. We've had actors, presidents, huge uh, world-renowned celebrities getting in on it. It's, it's, And I can see why after having seen this. I mean, as I say, I was aware there was a question, but I had no idea it ran so deep. Um, how how obsessed were you, Lisa? Well, gosh, it started all the way back in college. So as soon as I saw PBS Frontline, The Shakespeare Mystery, you know, that was it. I was hooked. Um, I didn't take a position, but, you know, it really set off in terms of an obsession when Laura and I interviewed Charlton Ogburn Jr., which, you know, he appears in the film posthumously, but because uh, he was in that original Frontline film, but, um, you know, we went to his house in South Carolina and, you know, the depth and the breadth of his knowledge uh, and, you know, all the way back to Mark Twain and, you know, all the great doubters. It's just, yeah, it was a 20-year odyssey before we actually, you know, set out with Roland Emmerich to bring those films forward. Records do exist for just about every other playwright at the time. That is missing for Shakespeare. How could the soul of the age be Mr. Nobody? So are we agreeing between us that it was Edward de Vere? Yeah. Oh, uh, no, we don't. I don't take a position, but um, I lean more group. I think uh, the Earl of Oxford is the soul journey throughout the canon. Um, but he certainly had a group of writers around him, a great salon, so to speak. What do you think, Laura? Yeah, I'd agree with you. I mean, De Beer is, there's more circumstantial and literary evidence pointing to De Beer being a pretty significant voice behind the canon, but he loved to collaborate. He was a patron of other playwrights. Uh, he was he was the birth of the, the Elizabethan theater. So he had to work as a group to get this up and running. But yeah, if there's a voice behind the sonnets and Hamlet, I, I put my money on De Beer at this point. Shakespeare dies and leaves no library. He hasn't kept any copies of his plays. He never left a letter, memo, anything. You know, I, I mentioned an obsession, but I think it's more a passion. Yeah. Um, we all have things that we're passionate about. Um, and they're important. I think they drive us. They give us life in a way. And each of us has our own. So, you know, and you two, your sisters, you're sharing this passion. Um, has it made you closer? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I would I would definitely say yes. I mean, this making a film is tough and being co-directors and co-producers 
um, really had interesting challenges and, um, you know, two minds, two eyes. This is a big, you, I mean, you got to want it with authorship, Shakespeare authorship. You got to really want it. And you've got to go in with all you've got. You got to go in with your mind and your soul and your intellect and having two at the job um, was a great thing. It kept us honest. It kept us clear. It kept us motivated when things got tough because it's a heated argument. It's a heated, there's a lot of passion on both sides of this argument. So, um, you know, holding hands and, and facing this together, I would definitely say brought us uh, closer together. The life and development of a genius may be incomprehensible to us mere mortals, but it shouldn't be untraceable. Um, I want to talk a bit more, have you talk a bit more about the pen and ink drawing. Uh, as I said, it's off. And if you could explain how it's off and the significance briefly, I'd, I'd love it. Well, the Jewel Shot Engraving, um, you know, came out with 1623 First Folio. That's the first time we, we see a, a face with the name. Um, the, the name itself, the pseudonym, as we would call it, Shakespeare, came out in 1593. Yes, with Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece. But it is until the First Folio that we actually get an image. Uh, it is tricky. Two right eyes, you know, you can clearly see that there's a mask, there's delineation for it. Um, you know, the, the doublet seems to be, um, you know, a, a seamstress's nightmare. You know, it's flipped wrong. Um, it just doesn't seem like a human being when you look at it. You know, I think Roger Strittmatter in the film, Lord, didn't he equate it to almost like a joker on a deck of cards? Yeah, it's a very Elizabethan joke, though. Once you start studying the period and understanding the engravings, this one has some pretty strange anomalies, even for Droshu, which was the, the engraver. Um, this is pretty peculiar for him. I think that he's done a lot better. So why would the greatest writer uh, have kind of a poor odd? I mean, he's in on it. Uh, clearly, if you want my opinion, um, it's an Elizabethan joke. And people say, well, you know, anagrams and ciphers and things like that, that's but to understand the Elizabethan mind and to understand the devices and the censorship at the time, they were using these devices to communicate and they were fun too. They loved to do this. So the gravy makes complete sense um, to me. And the fact that it's posthumous for the author, if, if you believe the Stratford man, he's long dead by 1623 when this image comes out. Um, it's, it's clearly a fix. And I mean, the poem next to it says, don't look at the picture. I mean, how many dedications or poems next to a to a, an engraving in a in a publication at this period say, "Hey, by the way, don't look at this picture if you want to find the author." I mean, it's it's pretty obvious if you take a close look. If you want to find Shakespeare, look through his works. Shakespeare biography is five percent fact and ninety-five percent fiction. Do you think that the public, in any way, the people who went to the theaters? Um, knew about it or were, were allowed to be in on it or was just a very aristocratic kind of a thing? That, that is a tricky thing because I do feel that the plays were not written for the public stage. You know, they had their origin in, in, the, in the court. They were written for the court. They were written for Queen Elizabeth. They migrate, obviously, to the playhouses. How much they would have been in on it uh, really hard to say, you know, some of these, these jokes are pretty, you know, aristocratic, but yeah, I think how could, I don't know, that's a tricky one, Laura, what do you think? Well, I think like you said, they were written for the court primarily, and when they migrated, it was a program. It was a, a sponsored program by the Queen and probably Lord Burley as propaganda, pro-Tudor propaganda. So once it got to the theaters, it was a kind of manipulated and carved into propaganda. And I think that it didn't really matter who the author was. I don't think that people go into the playhouses because it was a new art form were really thinking about the playwright so much, which made it great. So he could write, he could be a nobleman writing, but it could all be kind of above the board because aristocrats didn't write for the public playhouse. But the fact that it was a new art form that they didn't really care so much about who was writing it, it kind of worked for everybody for a while. For a while. <laughs> and then he started to talk about real important things when the end game came. And I think that's when, and that's what makes the whole authorship um, question for me so exciting is when the stakes got higher. The public buys it and the publishers put it out there. 
arguments based on the absence of evidence. That's dangerous. The book is not closed on who wrote Shakespeare. If he were the man from Stratford, there would be some evidence. That there is none speaks volumes. Readers who want to look beneath the surface will realize it's a hoax. It is the best who done it in the world.